Walls by Joseph Stone Part 1. The Nightmares Chapter 1 Rob Barton was dreaming of his first memory, which he always figured might itself be just a dream. The memory dream was in first-person point of view. It was not one of those third-person dreams where you could watch yourself and others from some floating seat up above. He saw crib bars rising high around him on all sides. There was muted, heated, arguing, pulsating itself into the room. He had no idea what he was doing, but in hindsight he seemed to be sort of escaping from it all. His pudgy little right hand went down and grabbed his own infant crotch firmly. Then he began to hum. It was one long, sustained, low note that had such a power in it that his arm broke out into goosebumps, which then spread to the rest of his body. Then it happened. The wall began to thud, crack, and splinter from the middle, and then ripple up to the ceiling and down to the floor. The breaking pattern resembled the shapes light makes in the bottom of a swimming pool, or the broken dirt on a sun-baked, dry lake bed. The rippled area of wall completely fell away, leaving a giant, black, gaping, jagged maw, wide enough for several people to stand in, like a skeletal jaw of a long-dead megalodon. The room was painted in the dark of night, and wallpapered in the designs the dappled light was bringing through the window. Despite the dimness, he could see it approaching from somewhere deep inside the giant hole. Then it was at the edge of the room and easily seen. It was larger than any man he had ever seen. The top of its head was just a bit below the ceiling. It looked humanoid. It was naked and dark purple, had no face, and the genitalia of a Ken doll. It had a somewhat bulky, masculine, muscular build. He didn't know if his memory was distorting it, but he was pretty sure it had no fingernails, and its feet resembled the head and the fact that they were completely featureless. It had ankles, but there was no separation where the toes would be. It turned its hairless, faceless head toward the crib. In some positions, the head looked like a helium-filled balloon attached to a thick neck and would have been comical if the memory dream wasn't so genuinely disturbing to him. It entered the room and looked down at the summoning babe. He, in turn, looked up at his visitor with overwhelming wonder, and just as its arms reached to pick him up, everything went black and he was awake. It was twenty-two years later. Rob washed off the remnants of the nightmare in the shower and got ready for work. He was a banker. He hated it. He was dumped on by any schmo customer off the street, which was the main description of his customer service-based job, dumped on by the management, and only glanced at from the corners of the eyes of fellow employees. He didn't mean to, but he wore his life experiences like a shroud, which was intriguing and off-putting at the same time. People were grudgingly envious of the knowledge that inherently came when you had tread down many hard roads. Movies were his escape. Horror movies were his favorite. He thought perhaps because they made him nostalgic. So far the one he related to the most was Jacob's Ladder. There was some truth in there. It was buried under a Hollywood Vietnam plot with a Twilight Zone-like ending, but the gist of the antagonist and the atmosphere was pretty damn close. People couldn't be trusted. His dog truly was his best and only friend. Max was a big, sweet, half-Rottweiler, half-Doberman, with the same aloof but decent qualities of his owner. He'd had Max since he was eight years old, and many a rough road had been traveled with Max right along at his side to help him through it. Rob's biggest recent concern was Max's inevitable death. He was in relatively good health, but age was taking its little tolls. He was getting slower, and his bones would creak every time he got up. Every time Max slept, which was becoming more and more frequent, Rob would look away from the TV and wait until Max's chest would rise and fall, and then he would look back at the carnage on the screen. By then the dream was completely forgotten. He got off the bus and entered the bank. He got his caffeine fix in the break room, and then went to his desk. Good morning, Rob, his wannabe frat boy manager said to him. Hey, Rob replied. As Rob approached his cubicle, the sports love and beer bonger who resented Rob's existence for some reason asked him to meet him in his office. That was never good. Rob entered first with a scumbag right behind who shut the door when they were in. We need to discuss your attitude again, said the dickhead. What is it now? Rob's attitude was relatively diplomatic. People here are uncomfortable around you. You never talk to anyone, and whenever you talk to me, you argue every little thing. Because you nitpick things that don't matter or have any real relevance to the job. There you go again. Look, why do you keep writing me? I do a good job here. The customers are happy with me. He didn't mention that they were happy with him because he took all their yelling and, and didn't just pass the buck around and absorbed a lot of their bullshit and usually got the issue resolved himself. I do everything I'm supposed to and all you do is threaten to fire me every week if I'm even a second late. 
It's August, and I've only missed two days this year. Been late three times under 15 minutes combined, and just because we have nothing in common and I don't want to be your best friend doesn't mean you can keep threatening me. You do a good job, huh? The bastard replied. He pulled a sheet of paper out of a file in his desk drawer and continued. What about this? He pointed to the page. Why did you leave early? You're not scheduled to be out of here until 6 p.m. The time pointed to was 1,700 hours, 59 minutes, and 44 seconds. Rob said, I left 16 seconds early? Yes, said the schmuck. Also, you turned off your computer over a minute early. Yeah, but I get here 15 minutes early to boot up that slow computer, so I just took a minute to shut it down so I could catch my bus so I can get home and let my dog out. Rob lived in a single apartment near downtown L.A., and the dog, who, before Rob moved out, was used to having a yard to piss and crap in all day long, was always grateful to see him for some bladder relief. You are off at six. If I see this again, I just might have to let you go. I don't want to have to do it, but you are giving me very little choice. The asshole tried to look sincere. You'd love to fire me. You just don't have enough on me. Although Rob was aware that it was what they called an employment-at-will basis, he foolishly thought he still had some rights. Now, the retarded jerk-off went on, we are having a bowling match against Gerard's team next week, and I want you there. You need to start contributing to our team. Gerard the gerbil was another manager. He was an okay guy, but he was just as gung-ho about the job as the prick. Apparently it's not just a job, it's a way of life. I can't. I have to let my dog out. Then do that and come back up here by eight and meet us down the road at the alley. I can't. The bus is almost an hour each way and I'll be too tired. And besides, I already have plans. Oh, please. What would a loser... The cocksucker trailed off. What? Nothing. Just get to work. Without another word from either of them, Rob exited the office alone and sat at his desk. He glanced at his Fangoria magazine and half smiled. He put on his headset and answered his first call. Good morning, customer service. This is Rob. Rob? An abrupt voice said. I just got a fee for a bounce check from your fucking bank and you are going to reverse it or I am going to come in there and break some skulls. Rob looked at the information that automatically popped up on his ancient computer screen in its bright green print and said, Well, sir, you haven't made a deposit since last month and you've been using your debit card almost every day and, well, the money ran out. What? No, it didn't. You fuckers are stealing my money. All right, sir, I've got it right here in my pocket, he snapped sarcastically. Rob? The shithead he worked for yelled from his desk wearing his own headset. It was obvious the pig in the tie had been listening in or monitoring his call, as they called it. Rob, feeling defeated, said, I'm sorry, sir. I am unable to reverse the fee unless it is an error on our part. The customer called him a motherfucker and hung up. Rob, later that day, waited until the clock on the phone said, 1,800 hours, 6 p.m. on the dot. He turned off his computer and ran for the bus. He just missed it. Max, who had been holding it for almost 10 hours by then, would have to wait 20 more minutes for the next bus to bring his buddy home. Rob got off the bus, which stopped a block away from his apartment, and ran home. When he got to his door, he absently ripped the menus off the doorknob and flung open the door, grabbed Max's leash, and together they ran downstairs, and Max, unable to hold it any longer, peed in the hallway on the way to the lobby door. I'm sorry, boy, Rob said, filled with guilt. He noticed the stink when he had first opened his door, so he knew Max had already had an accident. He walked into the kitchen, and there were two gelatinous puddles of diarrhea on the linoleum. Max looked filled with shame. Sweetie, it's okay. It's my fault. Rob kissed the top of his head. He set to work cleaning it up first with a scrub brush and a dustpan to collect the bulk to be flushed. He had the pan facing away from him, and when he brushed it into the pan, the bristles gave against its edge and splotted him with the mess. He stopped. His shoulders sank. He continued through the stage where it was ready to be cleaned with disinfectant. When he was finished, he took his second shower that day. He wrapped a towel around his waist when he was done and opened all the windows. The summer air came rushing in. He then picked up the menus he had thrown down in haste, and as he was walking with them towards the trash, he realized one of them was a note. The bottom of it said in bold print, Building Management. He read the rest above the dominating type. Dear Tenant, Many of your neighbors are complaining about the terrible smell coming from your unit. Regardless of your deposit, the living situation with your animal is no longer acceptable. Please remove the animal from the premises and proceed to have the carpet steam cleaned at your expense. There will be an inspection in two days to confirm this was done. Janine Tiernan, Building Management. Fuck, Rob breathed out. 
What pissy neighbor had called in the bogus claim? He called the manager's phone number, but it was after hours, so the only response was voicemail. He left a message. This is Rob. I just got your note. There is no way I'm getting rid of my dog. I promise I will have this place spotless for your inspection, but I paid $200 to have my dog here, and I'm not getting rid of him since I've had him for 14 fucking years. He set the phone down hard. He heard a coughing sound from the far corner of the room. He turned, and there was Max on wobbly legs by his food bowl, facing the floor and struggling for a breath. Rob ran up to him and knelt down, patting his back firmly. Max? Max, are you okay? Max coughed twice more and then looked up and gave him a lick on the cheek. He began wagging his stub of a tail. Jesus, boy, don't do that to me. Max sat down and grinned happily. Rob looked at him with relief. I guess the new chow ain't agreeing with you, huh? Max stood up and licked Rob, who was still kneeling, on the face with such force it almost knocked him over. You're a goofy boy, he laughed, and then got up to get ready for bed. It was early, but he was tired and his head was killing him. He could get migraine so bad his vision would blur, his speech would slur, and he could even end up projectile vomiting. He wanted to knock out before it got that bad. He popped four Tylenol PMs and was sound asleep in half an hour with the window still bringing in that soothing summer air. He was on the right side of the bed with Max sleeping just as soundly next to him on the left side. Five hours later, something happened. He never knew exactly what. A voice boomed on the other side of the apartment. Two syllables were shouted. Rob opened his unfocused eyes, which were wide with alarm. Max immediately jumped from the bed and ran into the kitchen and cowered in the corner. Rob went to him and looked back around with all of his hair standing on end. "'What is it, boy?' he said with a quiver in his voice. Max growled at him. In their fourteen years together, Max had never growled at him, not even when he was slapped or scolded for eating all the food on the counter or for peeing on the bed. "'What's wrong?' Rob knelt with him for a few minutes. Max was calming down and licking his floppy lips. Rob soon flipped on the TV for some white noise. The quiet was too creepy. From the sofa, Rob looked at Max, who was just sitting in the kitchen looking back at him. He thought maybe the voice had come from outside. He couldn't have imagined it. Max had clearly reacted, too. After about an hour, Rob got up and closed all the windows and called for Max to come back to bed. Max just sat there. Rob figured he'd better just give him some space. He went to brush his teeth. While foaming with toothpaste, he was absently muttering things like, If you want to mess with me, fine, but leave my dog alone. While he was rinsing, Max walked into the bathroom and sadly leaned his head against his buddy's leg. Rob spat into the sink and then said, You ready to go back to bed? Just then, the French windows right across from the bathroom door and right beside the bed swung open and a cold, harsh wind gust blew in, billowing the curtains and scattering the menus and the note about the floor. They had never found their way to the trash in all the upset. Rob instantly, and for some reason instinctively filled with fear, slammed the bathroom door shut against the wind and shouted through it out into the rest of the apartment, Go away! He hugged Max for almost five minutes before opening the door. The window's French doors were still wide open, but the air was stagnant. He closed the window's doors, locked them, and then he and Max got in bed and pulled the covers up tight.